information, the manifold repertoire, in which is shown that the repertoire of possible experiences is as large as one can imagine. What was the essential difference between the photodiode and himself, thought Galileo? Why did he see light or dark? Why was he conscious of it, whereas the photodiode just responded to it, like the simple machine it was? What was the critical difference? And suddenly the space became bright again, but this time it was not blank. Galileo saw he was immersed in a uniform, intense blue light. All was blue. And then, just as suddenly, all turned red. Then green and yellow. And soon he was seeing the space brightly colored, of one shade of color after the other. Thousands of them. And then it was colored of all those shades at the same time. And then something remarkable happened. In front of his eyes, what was before a featureless space became a wall, and then a painting appeared on the wall. It was a portrait, one he recognized all too fast. How young she was then! But before he could feel his old heart rest again in the grave of his chest, she had transformed it into another face, and then into another one face after the other, at increasing speed. At first he recognized them, but then faces appeared that he had never met. And some wore strange hats and even stranger hairdos. He might have seen a thousand faces. And then the painting changed and seemed to transform into a window. And the window showed a familiar old scene. It was Pisa where he had studied medicine and hated every part of it. But then suddenly it was not Pisa but Padua, where his discoveries had brought him fame, and then Rome, where his downfall had begun. And then it was countless other cities, and villages, and places, and palaces, and other rooms, and gardens, and mountains, and valleys, most of which he had never seen, and then through the window, the scenes were changing at even greater speed. And soon he was hearing voices outside, known and unknown, in languages known and unknown, saying something different every time, or even the same, but in a different tone, faster and faster. And then it was sounds and chords, all possible chords, and noises he had never heard. And then he started smelling the herbs of his garden, one after the other, sweet or pungent, and the smell of oil and that of old books, and that of death, and then, though he was not drinking, he tasted his wine and then other wines. He could not tell how many different ones, ones that were sizzling, and then syrups and spices too, but soon it was fruits, fruits he knew, and many more he did not, and then chestnuts and almonds, and there was more, there were dishes old and new, and flavours of dishes he did not know existed, and of game he could not imagine, strong and unique. And then he felt fear, fear that he was losing his mind, and then he felt angry, and then grateful, and then at peace. And then he felt a loss, so acute it pierced him like a knife in the heart, as when he had learned she was no more. And then the thought started, and they were too many. His mind was wandering from one to another, and he recognized his own thoughts, and then thoughts he had never had. He thought of his own grave and thought it would be in Florence and then it would not. And then he saw it, and saw his own body, and thought that he was separated from it. And so fast was he thinking that he became dizzy of thought, and
and the thoughts were evolving in his head, and they were going at such speed that he could not follow them, and then he felt empty and then collapsed. And then it could have been an instant, or it could have been forever, he saw Alturi. He had entered the room again, and had a smile on his face, like an enigma. You see what this means, said Alturi. When a man tells you he loves you above all others, you think you are special, and he is an angel. But if you happen to be the only man in the village, you are not very special at all, and he does not mean much by that. Galileo did not understand. You remember when the light turned blue. What did you think the photodiode was signaling when you saw blue? It could not possibly signal blue. All it could signal was light or dark, said Galileo. Precisely, commented Alturi. And after that, what did you experience? Far too many things for me to remember, answered Galileo. It all went red, then green. Then I went through colors, and shapes and faces, and scenes and places and sounds and thoughts. My mind went spinning, and I confess, it has not yet recovered. And what do you think the photodiode did? asked Alturi again. What could it do? Whenever the image had enough light, it would have signaled light. And whenever it did not, it would have signaled dark. And when there were sounds and smells and pains, it would have gone on saying dark. Would it not? Of course it would. Precisely, said Alturi, his face without expression. Just then a man entered the room, riding a strange bicycle with a single big wheel. The man was juggling balls and smiling absent-mindedly. His name was S. Gentlemen, let us not waste our time with images, said S. Let's not beat around the bush. What you need is simple. You need a formula. P log P, gentlemen. A formula for information. S came off the unicycle, still juggling. That will tell you how large is the repertoire of possible states. Take the photodiode, gentlemen. What's the uncertainty about which state it actually was in, if you do not know anything at all? Think about it. Its repertoire of possible states is small. Either it was on or it was off. Now say you obtain some information. That's the word, gentlemen. Information. Say you learn the photodiode was actually off. No matter by which means or mechanisms this information was generated, it eliminates the uncertainty. Now you know the photodiode was off rather than on. No uncertainty left. That's what information is, gentlemen. Reduction of uncertainty. And with the photodiode, where complete certainty means ruling out just one state out of two, the amount of information is just one tiny bit. On the other hand, gentlemen, he said quickly, turning around and letting the balls fall by his side, if the repertoire of possible states is large, say as large as that of your brain, then there is great uncertainty about which state it was actually in. Now again, if by some mechanism it is established that your brain was in a particular state and not in a trillion others, that's a lot of uncertainty eliminated. That's many, many bits of information, gentlemen. Bits, I say, because that's how information is measured by my formula, P log P. Beware of imitations. S mounted his unicycle. Just so you know, I also have the formula for juggling. <laughs> oh, and I almost forgot. He giggled. Information is a number, so do not ask it for a meaning. Never mind consciousness. He swerved and rode away. Perhaps, thought Galileo. But what did S mean? And what use was his formula? And then it dawned on Galileo. Perhaps the essential difference between the photodiode and himself was this. Every time he, Galileo, had a vivid experience, even the simplest one, such as pure darkness, 
His brain was not merely distinguishing one possibility from another. His brain was not just telling dark from light, though Alchuri had set him up like that. No, his brain and its complicated mechanisms were distinguishing between pure darkness and countless other situations, which would have led to trillions of different experiences. But to the photodiode, dark must have meant much less. With its simple mechanism, the photodiode had no way of knowing that dark was not a color, not a face and not a place, not a sound or smell or flavor, not a feeling and not a thought. To a photodiode, dark was not dark, but merely one out of two. To a photodiode, the whole universe merely was this or not this. Maybe the essential difference between the photodiode and himself, indeed, was information. So Galileo came to a simple thought. Perhaps it was due to the immense repertoire of alternatives that his brain could distinguish that he was conscious and the photodiode not, or infinitely less so. Consciousness makes up in number what it lacks in weight, he thought, remembering Sanctorius. This realization was so obvious that Galileo wondered why it had not occurred to him before. Notes Claude Shannon, an electrical engineer and mathematician, is the father of information theory. In his work and in the chapter, Shannon intimates that information is a number and is divorced from meaning. Just as science flourished, once Galileo removed the observer from nature, Communication and storage of data exploded once Shannon removed meaning from information. Later on, Galileo will begin to think that Shannon's prescription may be correct only from the extrinsic perspective of an observer. However, information integrated by the causal powers of a mechanism inside a system from the system's intrinsic perspective acquires meaning. In fact, it becomes meaning and the observer is returned to nature. Shannon's magnetic mouse, Theseus, was the first device, controlled by relay circuits, that was able to find his target in the maze by learning through experience. Aside from his work on information theory and communication, Shannon did work on an equation for juggling. He also built unicycles and loved to ride them through the hallways of Bell Labs. The most beautiful machine is also an idea of Shannon's. When the on button is pushed, the trunk opens, a hand comes out, turns the machine off and the trunk closes.